Good morning again. It's Michael Mallinson at the Canadian Rheumatology Association meeting. I'm with Dr. Sherry Rohaker this morning. And Sherry, I'm going to ask you to thank you for coming and I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and tell us about your role in rheumatology. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Sherry Rohaker and I'm a rheumatologist in London, Ontario with the University of Western Ontario. And I have a special interest in spondyloarthritis, in particular ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis. So I try to focus my clinical practices on seeing patients with those conditions, but I'm also very involved with research, particularly clinical research, with the Spondyloarthritis Research Consortium of Canada, as well as the International Psoriasis and Arthritis Research Team. And uh, hopefully we're trying to improve the lives of patients with these conditions uh, by doing that research. We appreciate that. <laughs> Tell me about one or two of the research projects that you're involved in at the moment. So part of my research interest is how having a, a chronic inflammatory arthritis affects people's ability to work. And there's been lots of data about people required to stop working or take an early retirement fr from work because their arthritis is affecting uh, how they can uh, perform at their jobs. But what isn't uh, as well known is how performance is affected when people stay employed. So it's a condition called presenteeism where people still show up, they're not absent, um, but they're spending a lot more time doing the same tasks and they may have, uh, that will certainly have reper repercussions amongst their coworkers and their bosses. And uh, unfortunately, a surprising number of patients don't disclose that they have arthritis to their coworkers or their supervisors. Um, with the thought that it might affect future promotions, etc. So there's a lot of really complicated issues at play, um, which might affect how patients with inflammatory arthritis can actually get by being employed. I know, I, I, I've lived that myself, I must say, and it's, it is difficult to disclose at times. So people, they are present, but they're not working because of pain, fatigue, etc. Right. Yeah. Um, do you have any clinical advice to them about how to cope with pain and fatigue? So it's, a, it's very difficult and uh, you know, unfortunately the things that have the best evidence are things that are very easy for me to say as a doctor, but very difficult to actually do in real life. Mm. Things like pacing, things like ensuring that you're getting the correct amount of sleep and practicing good sleep hygiene. And if you have support systems, including your coworkers and, and your employers, that in some cases can be useful, but in some cases can also sort of backfire. So, you know, the sad reality for a lot of arthritis patients is that they use up all their energy, they use up all their spoons, so to speak, mm -hmm. when they're at work, and then when they get home, they don't have very much time left for themselves or their families, um, or to do things that they enjoy. So, um, if you can get some, some help at work in terms of ergonomic modifications, in terms of pacing, I've had a lot of my patients have had success working from home where they can then set their own hours. Um, see if that's something that you can discuss with your, your workplace. Do you prescribe exercise at all for your clients? I do indeed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, do. I do indeed. And uh, actually, the CSA has come out with a, a wonderful booklet uh, mm -hmm. that goes through the, uh, some exercises that patients can perform and throughout the day. And we often use physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Uh, as well to try and, and help people succeed in managing their arthritis with more than just medications. Yes, uh, there was an excellent presentation here at the CRA about exercise as medicine. Yes. And um, quite surprising statistics about how exercise can reduce inflammation, reduce pain, reduce depression, etc. Yep. And, um, and improve quality of life. Improve quality of life. But yes. I'll just say for my patients, do as I say, don't do as I do. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little about clinical practices. Uh, what are the challenges? You know, patients complain that they have 10 minutes when they see their Ruby every six months or 12 months or something. Tell me some of the challenges from the other side of the desk. It's, it's interesting because our patients have chronic disease and we are fortunate to have patients who don't necessarily have high mortality from our diseases. They have lots and lots of morbidity in, in terms of things that affect their day-to-day -day lives. But that means as time passes, you accumulate larger and larger numbers of patients. So I've actually had, you know, my clinic, which was initially three days a week, is now starting to spread out to more time. In a sense, if your rheumatologist is spending not that much time with you, it might be an indication that you're actually doing well. Um, because they, they, <laughs> if you're stable, if you're taking your medication, getting your lab work done, and you're in a state of remission, 
I don't need to spend a lot, lot of time with you, which can be frustrating if you're driving from Owen Sound to London to see me, um, and, and you, you spend significantly longer getting there um, than actually talking to me, is the people who aren't doing well, who are having complications, or who have other psychosocial issues that need to be discussed, that end up taking a lot of time. And I just like to remind patients that if something like that happened to them and they weren't doing well, you know, they would be the person who I'm spending longer with and making other people late and in the waiting room. So we try to avoid it as, mu as much as possible, but uh, it does happen. Um, yes, I understand. And what about interprofessional relationships uh, uh, or partnerships, I should say, that uh, obviously you see patients with lots of comorbidities, cardiovascular, yeah. Uh, involvement, depression is another one, uh, they may have eye problems, skin problems, etc. How does that work? Is there a model of care in place or is it sort of just informally referring them onto another profession? It, it's informal at the current time, but we are trying to make some strides to make it a little bit more formalized. So there are particular, we know that there's a dermatologist that's specifically interested in psoriatic arthritis in our town, and we know that particular GI specialists are interested in inflammatory bowel disease. And we are trying to have some joint meetings and conferences with those people so that we can improve the understanding between the specialties. Um, for other conditions, we've been able to have some joint clinics. So for example, at, uh, at the University of Western Ontario, you can have a joint uh, rheumatology renal clinic uh, for vasculitis patients. Mm -hmm. But um, given uh, you know, the time constraints on dermatologists, ophthalmologists, and GI specialties, it's a little harder to do uh, for the seronegative stuff, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great information, thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience, uh, Anita? Uh, so you mentioned uh, someone wanted to know what exactly is uh, psychosocial and what are the psychosocial factors that may affect a patient's outcome. Fair enough. And, you know, when we, when we talk about people with arthritis, they're not just a bag of joints, right? It's how that arthritis is affecting them and how they interact with their family. And, and a lot of people, when they come in and see me, they'll, they'll express that they, they have this fear that their family doesn't quite get what they're experiencing. It's not like they're walking around with a cast or they have a big scar from their surgery. To many people from the outside, they look completely normal. Um, so, you know, people get into conflict with their spouses. You know, I've heard, heard people say their spouse thinks that they're lazy. I've heard people say that their, their children think that they're lazy and just not making enough of an effort. And that can be, that can really destroy those relationships. And there's even cases where things like the depression starts affecting uh, all of the interpersonal relationships. And when people have depression, they become less likely to do well with their arthritis, and it can cycle into itself. So you get poor sleep, which increases pain, and so on and so forth. And it, even in some sad cases, things where you know custody um, is being argued, like maybe the, the patient can't take care of their children properly because they have arthritis, which is rarely the case. So things like that, uh, you know, they're not specifically medical issues, but they really, really impact our patients and in a lot of ways, a lot more than just pain. You know, the patients yeah. can deal with pain. Mm -hmm. Arthritis patients are used to pain, um, but it's all the rest of the sort of stuff that goes along with yeah. it. Yeah, there's actually a component missing from that question. It's, it's psychosocial economic. Exactly, and absolutely. I think the economics often has, comes into play as well. And, and we try to reduce how much that is, mm -hmm. um, but you know, we sometimes run into a situation where, for example, if someone is self-employed, they often make too much money to receive uh, good exceptional access coverage. So if you're asking for an expensive medication, it ends up being largely out of pocket. Um, and that person may sometimes choose not to go for an expensive medication that might help them for that mm -hmm. reason. Um, fortunately, we have, in, at least in our region, we have um, actually very compassionate pharmaceutical companies that will often give um, access to those medications on a case-by-case -case basis. But it, it certainly can affect uh, that. Yes. Okay. We'll just check if there's any other questions. Uh, so for friends and families of someone living with uh, spondyloarthritis, how can they help the patients more? So the, the best thing is to try and help with pacing and try to help with stress reduction. Um, and just having that acknowledgement that even when someone seems like they're having a good day, there is this underlying inflammation, fatigue, stress on the body. 
Um, and patience, I think, is the is the key thing as well. Patience for patients. Patience for patients. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's good to have that support network there in the family and understanding it. And Sherry was kind enough to mention the Canadian Spondylitis Association's AS guidebook, which has a couple of um, paragraphs in there for family and for employers. So, Sherry, that was wonderful. Great information. Thank you for coming in and giving us your Thank time. Thank you for having Thank me. You. <laughs>